by taking you on a harrowing trip back into an age of bigotry. This month marks 50 years since the British government passed the Sexual Offences Act, decriminalising homosexual acts between consenting men over the age of 21 in England and Wales. Until then, gay men had lived in fear of imprisonment or discovery, often leading double lives in order to avoid detection. Louise Hidalgo has been talking to a comedian and radio presenter, Pete Price, who, at the age of 18, was subjected to aversion therapy, which was supposed to cure his homosexuality. In reality, that type of therapy was degrading, humiliating and is now discredited. People have no idea of the fear that people went through to live their life, to try and be normal because of the blackmail, because of the queer bashes, because of the suicides. There were so many people killing themselves because they couldn't accept who they were and they were frightened of going to prison. It, it was horrendous. Pete Price was 12 when he first realised he was gay. It was 1958. At that age, I didn't know it was a crime, but I knew it was abhorrent to most people. And I, I also knew at school that if you got a reputation of being a queer, because uh, that was the word they used in those days, that you were stuck with it for life. So I actually spent a lot of time chasing girls to cover up how I felt and what people would think of me. That double life, hiding who you were, living always in fear of being caught, was part of being homosexual in 1950s and 1960s England. So I was very scared and I lived a very, very strange life. Like so many gay people in those days, I lived a lie. When you got married, were you consciously aware of the fact that you were marrying somebody with homosexual tendencies? No, I was marrying somebody I loved and that was it. This woman married a homosexual. Twice during their marriage, he was arrested for importuning. The second time, he killed himself, rather than face the punishment of a court and the disgust of his friends. It wasn't just prejudice, it was also ignorance. Many people then thought that homosexuality could be treated or cured. In the 1920s, doctors in Germany had implanted the testicles of dead men into homosexuals in the belief that it would boost their testosterone levels. By the 60s, they were using electric shocks and behavioural therapy. It was a belief the young Pete Price would pay dearly for. Pete had been adopted as a baby. His adoptive father left home when he was 10, and Pete's mother, who he was very close to, brought him up in Liverpool. When Pete first had those feelings at age 12, he didn't know what they were, but he did know he couldn't tell his mother, so he told the family doctor and he laughed in my face. I went back at 14 years old and told him again, and he prescribed Valium. Pete didn't use the tranquilizer Valium. He threw them away, and he went on living the lie. Until when Pete was 18, his mother found out he was gay. I was working in a nightclub called the Cabin Club and I had two very, very nice bosses who would allow me to save time up and go to London so I could be who I wanted to be. And I met people down there and somebody sent me a stupid childish letter, something like, uh, if you marry David, I'll kill myself. It was pathetic. And my mother was a very private person, so was I. So my mother didn't go searching, but this stupid letter had fallen out. I came home, it was two o'clock in the morning. She was in bed. I can see her right now. She looked like the life had drained from her face. And she said to me, what does this mean? And my stomach churned over and I, it was horrendous. And I went, I'm a homosexual. To which she was violently ill. Pete's mum pleaded with him to go back to the doctor with her. And we went to see him and he was the one that said, oh yes, there's a cure. This cure was aversion therapy. Aversion therapy is based on the idea that homosexuality is a learned behaviour and that learned behaviours can be unlearned if associated with something unpleasant enough. Pete was apprehensive, but he agreed to it, mainly for his mother's sake. She had no idea what I was going to, and I had no idea what I was going to. 
didn't tell a living soul. Because remember, it was a criminal offence. So how could you be treated by the NHS uh, as Peter Price? So they gave me a false name and they checked me into a mental institute. It had bars on the window. And in fact, after what they did to me for 20 years, I could not drive past that place because I started to shake in fear. After three days, Pete was taken to see the psychiatrist. Some listeners might find his account of what happened next disturbing. And the psychiatrist started questioning me about my sexuality with a Grundy tape recorder, using the most brutal language you could possibly hear, with the most brutal descriptions of the way you had sex as a homosexual. And that lasted an hour. They then took my pyjamas off me and put me in a room, a very dingy room with no windows, with a male nurse in the corner. So they put me in the bed naked and they asked me what I drank. And in those days I drank Guinness and there was cases of Guinness at the side of the bed. So they gave me dirty books. It was men in bathing costumes. <laughs> there was not, it wasn't a turn on in any shape or form. So I've got the books, I've got the tape recorder, I've got the Guinness. So they played the tape recorder and it's me talking to the psychiatrist, looking at the books, drinking the Guinness. And that lasted an hour. But halfway through the hour, they gave me an injection and I just instantly fell ill. And I said to the nurse, please, I need to go to the toilet. I'm going to be sick. And he just said, just do it. Well, this was totally alien to me, to be sick on myself, to defecate myself in a bed. So I lay in my own excrement, lay in my own vomit, listening to this psychiatrist absolutely degrading me and making me feel worthless and filthy and unnatural. And for 72 hours, for 72 hours, I lay. I had no water. I had no food. Not that I could eat food. I was climbing the walls. But I wasn't getting cured. All I was doing lying there was, will I ever get out of here alive? At the end of those 72 hours, the psychiatrist came and said they were bringing the next stage of the treatment forward. I can remember him saying, we'll now put the electrodes on your penis, to which... I, I can't explain. And in fact, telling you now, all these years later, I'm now breaking into a cold sweat. So they wanted to put electrodes on my penis so that if I got an erection by being turned on by a man, they could shock me to stop me doing it. I want it out. Somehow, and he still doesn't quite know how, Pete managed to persuade them to let him go. Pete never told his mother what had happened. He says she would never have forgiven herself. A few months after he managed to get out of hospital, Pete happened to be in a gay bar in Manchester, when who should he see there but the same psychiatrist? Standing at the bar, laughing, joking and outrageously camp, was the psychiatrist. The man that put me through that torture was gay. I, and I'm physically not violent in any shape or form, tried to kill him. I actually tried to kill him with a bottle. Luckily, Pete was pulled off him before he could do any harm. Aversion therapy hasn't been used on homosexuals in the UK since the 1970s. It was declared dangerous in the US in 1994. Some organisations, however, do promote what they call conversion therapy. Peter Price has gone on to have a successful career as an openly gay comedian and radio talk show host. He still lives in Liverpool. Louise Hidalgo and Pete Price is the subject of this week's Witness film on our website. As you might imagine, it's harrowing stuff, but perhaps that's the reason for thinking about history in the first place, to learn the lessons. Just search for BBC Witness Films. So let's look a bit further at the history of aversion therapy. Joining me now is Dr Chiara Beccolosi, Senior Lecturer in the Modern History of Medicine and Sexuality at the University of Lincoln in the UK. Where did this idea come from and was there any, ever any scientific basis for believing that aversion therapy could work? Um, the history of aversion therapy has uh, its uh, root in, uh, in the late 19th century, really. 
In the 1870s, uh, a psychiatrist started to argue that uh, homosexuality, same-sex behaviors, were psychiatric disorders. So they started first in continental Europe, then in the US, then in the UK. They started to classify homosexuality as a psychiatric disorder in their manuals. While some psychiatrists believe that homosexuality in itself was an inborn condition and not treatable, other psychiatrists started to argue that it could be acquired. So we have already at the end of the 19th century some psychiatrists promoting hypnosis to treat homosexuality. Interestingly, at the end of the 19th century, gynecologists, psychiatrists developed more invasive methods to treat homosexuality for women. But the version therapy in itself, as we know it today, as Pete has described in his account, was developed in the 1930s. Is there any evidence that that sort of therapy, aversion therapy, ever worked? I mean, is there, is there a, a, a clinical official line now as to whether homosexuality is, in, in, in any sense, a learned behaviour. In 1973, the American Psychiatric Association declared that uh, aversion therapy was not scientific, it was uh, unethical and inefficient. Um, the official position of psychiatrists around the Western world, at least, is that aversion therapy does not work. But there are still uh, psychotherapists, psychiatrists that uh, basically uh, carry out uh, conversion uh, therapy or counselling. And, and that can these days be yeah, done yeah. through religious organisations? Um, regularly, newspapers in um, in the US, in Italy recently, in South Africa, uh, even China have reported cases in which uh, um, there are groups, they are called conversion therapy camps, especially teenagers, are sent quite often by uh, their parents. The parents force them to go. And sometimes uh, uh, psychotherapists uh, help these groups. But looking back in time, I mean, historically, um, to what extent has homosexuality been seen as an illness that has, in any sense, the capability of being cured? Well, psychiatrists were divided amongst those who believe that uh, homosexuality was an inborn condition and therefore not treatable, and those who believe that it was acquired or maybe even inborn. For example, between the 19, 1910 and 1930, increasingly endocrinologists came to argue that uh, uh, homosexuals are characterized by a high level of female sex hormones. So it was possible, according to some endocrinologists, to treat uh, male homosexuals by injecting uh, male sex uh, hormones. And, and some of the ideas from the past seem you know, very bizarre, like that suggestion that uh, in Germany testicles were implanted into uh, gay men in order to increase their... Yeah. Their testosterone. Uh, they were called uh, grafting uh, operations uh, and uh, they started to be developed in continental Europe uh, around 1910, really. Increasingly, in, uh, in the 1940s, uh, endocrinologists uh, used uh, drugs, injections, uh, then there was the use uh, of uh, uh, lobotomy in some cases. We have heard Pete telling about uh, electric shocks. Um, these were all uh, different medical treatments developed by different branches uh, of medicine. Extraordinary. Dr. Chiara Beccanossi, Senior Lecturer in the Modern History of Medicine and Sexuality at the University of Lincoln. Many thanks.